Scotty Braun and AJ Przinski on Legends Territory today. And thank you to our MLB Players Alumni Association fan for setting up all of these conversations. Make sure you check out baseballalumni.com for more info on your favorite former players. And also, you can get the podcast version of this show on Spotify and on Apple. Now, let's bring in our next legend, a five-time All-Star, a three-time World Series champ. He's got a no-hitter to his name, 200 wins, ERA in the three-and-a-half range. John Lester joining us right now on Legends Territory. John, how's life? It's good, man. I can't complain. Retired life has uh, been good to me. Dude, you can smile. It's okay. You got like two hundred million in the bank. There you go. <laughs> I mean, smile. I mean, you play golf every day. I mean, Jesus, uh, life yeah. ain't that bad. No, it ain't. It ain't. It ain't. It's been good. What have you been up to? So, when you retired, what was on your mind in terms of what you wanted to do? being that you played for 16 seasons and were traveling all over the place. To, have you been kind of chilling or are you like AJ and you still travel the world? <laughs> uh, I don't, the, the travel part has been okay. It's been more or less, I, I think I spend more time at the, at my kid's baseball field than I spent, you know, playing all those years. So I've been running the Uber service back and forth to school and back and forth to practice. And I mean, really when I, re, when I was done, I was like, man, what am I going to do with all my time? And, we really haven't had a lot of time, so it's been good, man. It's it's kept me busy. Um, you know, the, being around little kids baseball has been fun to kind of, you know, still have it as a part of my life. But at the same time, like, you know, it's different. So I'm like dad now as opposed to the, the baseball player. So it's been good. I've enjoyed it. And a lot of golf, like you said. Hey, m huge misconception. When you're a baseball player and you play for a long time, and you get out and your kids are of that age where they're doing things you have less time than you did as a player. Yeah. Okay. Just now the good part is my kids drive now. So now you have lots of time again. Yeah. So when they start driving, it's life changing, but until they drive, shoo, 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 shoo. and because you were gone for so long, the wife is like, here, you got them. <laughs> Take them wherever they got to go. You're the taxi. Yeah. Well, you missed a lot of those. No, things, you miss it. hundred percent. Right? Spring and summer. Especially. You're trying to catch up. Even mm -hmm. though you can never really catch up, but yep. it's still fun. No. Carpool King. That's right. That that's carpool King. That is 100% true on that. Well, where you live, the traffic is not very bad at all. So, I mean, not at all. In the no. Atlanta area, there's no cars, no traffic. Yeah, it's right. easy to get from A to B. <laughs> Do you go to many games or watch a lot of baseball, or have you kind of taken a break? Um, Here and there. I mean, my, my boys like are kind of into just uh, watching certain guys that they know that I played with. Um, you know, obviously with the brave success the last couple of years being in Atlanta, they, they've, they've kind of gravitated towards that. So, you know, we'll sit down and watch a little bit of the games, but uh, you know, I think we're going Thursday to the game. It's the last day of school. So we're, we're taking them over to the, to the Braves game for, for, and they're playing the Phillies. So they want to go see Schwarber and all that. So, um, you know, I, I think as I kind of get settled, I'll, I'll, go to more games but as far as watching them on tv I, you know here and there not a lot who, who do you root for do you root for the red sox do you root for the cubs uh you know what i don't know like i i really don't know like when we were up in boston uh i guess a month or so ago um you know it's fun to go back and kind of root for them i don't really know anybody on that team anymore uh so that that's kind of that's kind of difficult um you know with, with the cubs you know i got i got rossi there so i, I like to you know, hope, hopefully he does well. Uh, Happer uh, is still there. Um, and then all the clubhouse guys, those, those were my buddies uh, when I was there. So, yeah, I, I would say probably lean a little bit more towards the Cubs and the Red Sox right now. Which ballpark did you like better, Wrigley or Fenway? Ooh. Um, I think probably, man. Fenway's Fenway's great. I, I did I did like Wrigley because of all the day games. That was you know that was a lot of fun. You you kind of have more of a normal nine to five schedule type deal. Um, but man, it's hard to compare those two ballparks. They're a little bit different. Wrigley's kind of got a little more uh, intimate feel, a little smaller. And then when you when you step into Fenway, it's just got that big kind of cathedral look to it with the green monster and and then you know the big stands in center and right. So. Uh, just a little bit different, but I, I would probably pick the day games at Wrigley. Yeah, of course. Especially in <laughs> Chicago. Dude, you're done. Yeah. You're home. Yeah. It's 5 o'clock. You're like, huh, I live yeah. a normal life. Some guys are late night people, though, and don't want to wake up early. Well, that's you because you're at the 
to music festivals. Yeah, exactly. You know, all night. John, <laughs> does, John doesn't do that, though. John's more of a country boy. He wants That's to... why you guys got along to, what, three times that you caught him? Yeah, three life? whole times, yeah, baby. Exactly. Three whole so, times. I was going to ask who your, who your favorite catcher is, and I'll just put earmuffs on AJ that you worked well, with. Well, it's David Ross. I mean, yeah. it should be. I mean, two World Series with the guy. I mean, I think David Ross would win that fight. Yeah, I mean, it, it was kind of – just for whatever reason, we worked well together. I don't know why. It just it it, it w- kind of was what it was, and um, we got on a roll that that carried for a few years, I guess. Um, you know, so I, I don't know. Like I wish I wish I could explain it. I wish there was ways to explain it, but we just we worked well together. We communicated well together, and um, you know, it, it translated on the field for the most part. Trust me, I had some bad, I had some bad ones with him, uh, you know, as well. So it's not like it was uh, because of you. I promise. No, it's okay, John. I won't take it personal at all. It's all right. You, you know, it's <laughs> no, okay. No. You only got me DFA'd from the Red Sox. I ended up in St. Louis, so it's okay. It's all your fault. I blame totally okay. nobody but yourself. It all worked out. It all yeah. worked out. No, it was actually I I enjoyed catching John. He was fun because he was like fastball in, cutter in, fastball in. But the sign he used these crazy signs. I don't know. I mean, you're retired now, but he was like, yeah, two was fastball in. You had to like, and it was like, and then five was fast. It was all these crazy. It wasn't different like from most pitchers. A- anybody else I'd ever seen. Really? Yeah. He, he was like, what was it two fastball that in, five fastball was, uh, away, one was it, curveball. Yeah, that, was, that was just with the runner on second. We did a, the addition. So five, five was away, six was in. And then, um, you know, one, one added to two was curveball, one, two was cutter, and then two, two or three, one or whatever. It all added up to the number. And then four was change up. So just tried to keep it, you know, now you got the pitch com. You don't have to worry about all that stuff. So it, it just tried to keep it from, you know, guys getting your signs. Were you worried about sign stealing, especially later in your career with everything that happened over that little time period with? obviously the Astros, but even the Yankees and, and the Red Sox to an extent. Yeah. I mean, you, you had, you had teams that would come in or, or, or you would go, it was mainly when you would go to their place that you, you started to kind of pay attention to what was going on. And there were certain teams that, you know, had the rumors about sign stealing and, and, you know, the red dots on cameras and first base, third base coaches, all that stuff. So, you know, you kind of knew going into those places that you needed to maybe change up your signs or change up, something uh way the catcher set up or whatever to you know kind of combat those things but not to i don't think we were really worried to the extent of what it's kind of come out to be um you know i think it was more of within the the game within the game and and guys trying to figure your signs out and and that sort of thing not the not the trash cans and all that See, now you know why I couldn't catch him, because I couldn't count that fast. <laughs> <laughs> I could not do that. There's a lot to manage. And now with a pitch clock, although he could have used pitch clock. Pitch clock would make I, – I mean, I just think that would make life so much easier. Yeah. Just press a button, you hear it, and you say yes or no, and then you press <laughs> another button. Okay, I like that one. Let's throw it. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think obviously anything new, everybody's kind of skeptical about, right? Like, so when I first heard about the pitch clock, like, no chance am I ever using that. Um, you know, I just want the regular signs. But – I think now you've seen it where, you know, guys are kind of taking it the next step where the pitcher has it too and, and can kind of relay, you know, obviously with the pitch clock, they got to be a little bit faster. You can't shake 17 times. So you got to, um, you know, get that sign you want so the pitcher can actually push it now. So I, I think, you know, I think it, it, it's it's helping, um, you know, hopefully that kind of combats all the all the sign stealing and pitch stealing and all that stuff uh, to, to a certain extent. So. Uh, and you're seeing it. I mean, the games are faster. They're moving along pretty good. John, what do you think about the way that MLB has been handling sticky stuff, especially this year? I mean, Max Scherzer's been suspended. Domingo Herman's been suspended. You could make the case that they were different situations. There's been guys asked to wash their hands. Where do you think we're at with how to handle it? Because I know, you know, there was a crackdown and now it seems like the onus is on the league and they don't know what to do. Yeah, you know what? I think they need to figure something out that guys can use. Um, you know, and and the, the the hard part is is you know I've heard about AJ and I were talking about this a couple of weeks ago in, in Dallas, and you know I heard how they wash their hands. They use you know rubbing alcohol, and then you know they're supposed to clean their hands with that. But if you use rubbing alcohol, you can go right back to the rosin and make it sticky again. So 
you know, I, I think there's some gray area. I think there's some some things that need to be cleaned up. Uh, you know, to to kind of steal a line from from Scherzer himself. It, I don't think they have a sticky substance problem. I think they have a spin rate problem. So you need to figure out a way to allow guys because playing in Chicago, AJ, you know this, when it's 40 degrees and the wind's blowing, you know, that ball feels like a cue ball. And it, it, it's tough to grip. And even in the summertime when it gets hot and you start sweating a lot, it, it can be tough to grip sometimes. So I feel like there should be a way to use something that doesn't create you know, these anomalies of spin rate. And I mean, there's smart enough people in the game to, to figure this stuff out. So I, I, I just, it, I, I, like I said, I think there's a gray area that they're trying to walk this line and, and it's, it's working, but it's not, you know, you're seeing these guys, you don't want to see Max Scherzer get suspended for 10 days based on a, on a misunderstanding. Um, you know, that that's one of your faces of the game and you want him out there pitching every five days. So, uh, I, I just think there there needs to be a way that, that that these guys can get together and figure out something that everybody can use and everybody's happy with, where it's not doctoring the ball, it's not making it move more or, or spin faster. It's just allowing the pitcher to have a nice, you know, good grip on the ball. All right, so I'm going to ask you the question, and you can tell me to fuck off. Where'd you where'd you keep your shit? Um, I had mine up on the thumb of your glove, right? Yeah, you, you were left-handed, so you. So it was here. Yeah. And you just kind of went. I saw, I used to watch you. You used to turn around. You used to turn your back and kind of give it a little. Yeah, I mean. Yeah, you, you know. know. We were okay with it, though. It was, it was, it wasn't. Well, everyone did that. Everyone did it. So it, some guys would go down here to their belt or they'd grab their hat or whatever it was. It wasn't a big deal. No. And, and too, and it's different than what, what a lot of people think, too. Like I said, it, it's not helping the ball move, right? Like it's not, you're not throwing the you know, the spit ball or snot ball or whatever. It's, it's literally for grip. And um, like I said, if that grip isn't creating spin rate, then I don't see that there's really any problem with it. Um, you know, like I said, man, like you, yeah. you Dude, listen, when you were throwing that cutter and you went and got sticky stuff to those righties, trust me, they wish you didn't <laughs> have it. Okay. Because you were like, Oh, watch this. I'm going to get a little extra sticky stick and I'm going to throw yeah. this. Yeah. Hey, man, I mean, like I said, it, I don't think it ever, other than gripping the ball, I don't think it ever helped my spin rate. I, I don't, I could be wrong. Um, you know, I, yeah, I mean, it may have helped my cutter break a little bit, a little bit better, but, um, you know, I don't know. I, like I said, I, I just, I feel like there's a spin rate problem and well, there was now I feel like it's coming back and uh, back down to normal. Uh, you're going to have certain guys that can spin the ball better than others. And that is what it is, but. Uh, the sticky stuff, man, I think kind of got blown out, you know, especially now it's, it's, it's just something that we really shouldn't even have to worry about. Remember, remember the game we were 2014 with the Red Sox and Michael Pineda had the, Oh yeah. The tattoo of pine tar on his neck. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah I mean, <laughs> but that's the other part is like, let's, you know, don't make it. I think the other, the other side of it to the hitters is there were some guys that were just making it blatantly obvious and, kind of rub it in people's faces for lack of a better term. Um, you know, if you don't put it in everybody's face, then I think, I think it, it is fine and you can kind of do what you need to do. Hey, take me back when you're thinking about your career to the most special moment, because you have many to choose from, um, and the most dramatic moment. And that could be on or off the field uh special moment i mean i think probably lumps into one is is you know i think your debut and then your first win i, I think are probably those two right there are you know because you, you you try to you try to work to get called up and then when you get called up now you got to perform and now you get a w and you kind of feel like okay I, I can do this uh that's a pretty special feeling um and then what was the other part what was the second one most dramatic. So Most dramatic. Obviously, you played with some teams that had a lot of personalities running through. <laughs> yeah, um, man, I, I would say I, I don't think there really gets any better than Game Seven of a World Series, you know, and, and getting to be a part of that, and especially being a part of the Cubs organization with everything going on with that whole dramatic curse and and you know all that stuff. So I think that was probably the most dramatic time that 
in my career that that I can remember. It probably stands out the most, I, I would say. Which one? So, okay, so then that leads to the next question. Which which World Series meant more? The two Man, with the Red so, Sox or the Cubs one? Because most pe- I think if you ask most people, they remember you as a Red Sox mm-hmm. over a Cub, even though you're on that 2016 team. But which one means more? Man, so I've had this question a lot, and the, and the I think the easiest way I've, bro- I've broken it down for people is so 07 was very, very different for me. I was a part of a team as a young guy that was supposed to win it, and we had some studs, and and I just got to be a part of it. And then coming back from cancer, um, you know, made that one very, very unique for me personally. Uh, 13, we weren't supposed to do anything, and then the Boston Marathon and being a part of that and seeing the city kind of come together and – you know, and then that was kind of my first time. All right, here, here's game one, game five. You're you're the guy. We're riding how you pitch, basically, and and to be able to perform and and have a good postseason that year. And then sixteen, you sign. You know, I signed with the Cubs to do this, and and we we did it. So it's like three different things at different points in my career that mean. You know, this is very political, AJ. Very, they all mean the same. Well, they all mean more <laughs> in different ways. But they're all like World Series. So it's like hard to pick one that stands over the other. I mean, like I said, you got the Boston Marathon and then you got 108 year curse, you know? So it's like these things in, in the world of uh, like not only baseball, but in our lives to be a part of these things, you know, it's just a different, different feeling for each one. That is such the politically correct answer. I feel like I nailed yeah. it too. That was but, pretty yeah, good. but when you have three of them, you know, you're like, oh man, three, only three World Series. Oh man, <laughs> I feel like he somewhat eliminated at least one of them. Like he, oh he seven, because he, uh, yeah, thirteen, but oh seven. I mean, 16. he did come back from cancer. It wasn't like, yes. it wasn't like he had a sore hamstring. I mean, he had cancer for God's sake. <laughs> yeah. Well, and that, like I said, that one was more, more like a personal thing for me, you know, like, and to be to come back from that. Um, you know, and I was just kind of part of that team. I wasn't, I wasn't like a, a, a guy on that team. I and mean, we had so many dudes on that team. It was crazy. Mike Lowell, Manny Ramirez, Ortiz, Beckett, Schilling. I mean, the list goes on. Veritek. And, you know, so I just, I was a piece. Um, and I didn't, you know, I didn't make the team out of spring training. And, and you know, I just felt like I was a part of it. Um, where, like I said, the other two were were so different for me but at the same time I mean like I said you win so it's 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 hard to it's hard to compare them um on the winning side who did you hang out with I mean I remember some of the moments with Boston being in the clubhouse post game and and seeing you and Lackey kicking back but what do you remember on about your friendships and, and who you spent time with yeah, I mean, Lack and, and Beckett were were my two mm-hmm. dudes. I learned I learned a lot from those guys, uh, especially Josh early in my career. Um, you know, as far as being, you know, preparing and and pitching and uh, how to be a big leaguer and and all that stuff. So th- those those guys, and then obviously Lack, I ended up finishing or not finishing. I ended up playing um, his last couple of years with him in in Chicago, and and that was cool to to see you know, kind of how he transformed from 2010 when he signed with us in, in Boston to, uh, you know, finishing out his career uh, with, with the Cubs and, and winning that and, and being a part of that. So uh, I would say those two guys were probably my, you know, the, the guys I hung out with the most. Um, you know, then as I got older in Chicago, it was Riz and Happer and, um, you know, when Rossi was there, uh, those guys. So, um, but yeah, man, I mean, that I think that's that's the part that, that you miss the most is not necessarily the grind of the game, but you know, the, the, the relationships and the, the hanging out in the hotel rooms and the stories and the travel and, you know, all that stuff. So, uh, you know, I definitely miss those guys and, and the hang and, um, but definitely don't miss the getting ready for those games. All right. So 2011, who ate all the chicken and beer? Who ate the chicken (laughs) and who drank the beer during the game? (laughs) Man, that story got so blown out of proportion. It, it's it's insane. Um, you know, the chicken thing started as an innocent innocent deal in, in actually 2010. And I think in, in 2011, we may have ordered it like once or twice through the entire year. 
Um, and you know how it is, AJ, like the, the, you know, you get tired of the food in the clubhouse and, you know, you want something different and, and, you know, that happened to be right across the street. And, um, so we, we had that a couple times and then the, the beer thing was, was more of a camaraderie deal that, that, like I said, got blown out of proportion. And, and, you know, I think they, they looked for, um, kind of something to blame that season on, which, you know, we didn't play well going down the stretch and, and that was partly because the pitching staff didn't pitch very well. And, um, you know, that happens and it, it, I don't, I would l like to blame it on us. just not pitching well and not anything else. That's a good answer. No, I listen as a former player, starting pitchers, they used to drink during the game. Yeah. I mean, drink, it wasn't like one dude. I remember listen, 2005 white Sox. I mean, Mark Burley pitched in the world series drunk. Came in and got a save. He was drunk. <laughs> like, he was full drunk. Uh, it wasn't like – it wasn't a – not a – On the, start days, guys were drinking? Not on start – no, right. no, I'm saying no. Like non -start, no, no, not on start days. Just no. clarifying for everybody. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. not on start days. But yes. on – you you would see a guy in, in the dugout. They'd have a cup, and there was usually an adult beverage in it. Mm -hmm. They were starting pitchers. They had no chance in the American League to get in the game. So, they were like, eh, what else are you going to do for four hours sitting there? So why why did they pick on on his squad when Boston? everyone was doing it? Because it, it was Boston. Boston? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, it, like I said, it, it, it was a uh, you know you got to love the you know um, uh, you know the 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 sources that like to to come out and say things behind closed doors and and you know then all of a sudden it ends up in the the media. Um, you know that's the whole thing. If it was one of our teammates or or front office people that called us out in the to our faces or to the media and, and put their name behind it, it. It's one thing, but when you're a source, I, I have a hard time believing anything that, that they're going to say. If the place where you ordered the chicken from called you and was like, yo, we want to do a sick commercial with you and make fun of the whole damn thing. Would you be in if it was well put together and, and pitched to you and maybe like a good chunk goes to charity or something? Um, so actually when that season ended uh or it might have been spring training the next year i don't remember but the it was the popeye's chicken right around the corner they're, they're out of business now we checked when i was up there a couple about a month or so ago um it said on the billboard it said four out of our four out of the five starting pitchers prefer our chicken so i thought that was pretty cool <laughs> <laughs> uh, Listen, if you, if you, didn't have, you probably never even had Popeyes, have you? No, I have in the past. Oh, yeah, oh, why? Because so you're saying that it it's so good. Yeah, Popeyes yeah, so it, good. it's yeah. <laughs> that's good. That's, that's good. That's clever by them. It um, was, yeah, they nailed it. They nailed it with the slogan for sure. Yeah, but I mean, they could have gotten the next step and like you know thrown a, an offer or something. Although they're out yeah, of business, no, maybe they didn't have yeah, much marketing Yeah, but 2011 money. was. I mean, you remember the way it ended with the games in Baltimore, the whole, the whole craziness, right? So I mean, it was. I don't know that I don't know if the Red Sox would have. Okay no, not one. right then. You need you need some separation, <laughs> obviously, like you do with anything. And I mean, also, as you know, the thing with Boston that's interesting is and this is really for the whole 2000s, like most baseball fans would trade what their teams have done for what the Red Sox have done in the 2000s. Right. Plenty of World Series titles. It's just. It's a lot of media coverage, and they've had a lot of ups and downs where it's it's first, it's a World Series, it's last. In my mind, as a fan, I would trade for that versus a team that's just like kind of always making the playoffs but not getting over the hump. I mean, even if you just look at their rivals, like the Yankees haven't won since 2009. Look what the, the Red Sox have done yeah. since 2009. So in my mind, if you're a Boston fan, John, and correct me if I'm wrong, like They've had World Series titles. Yeah, you've had ups and downs and drama, but we're also in the entertainment business, so it's fun to follow. Yeah, I mean, it's the, like but AJ. I mean, obviously AJ's there, and he understands the media, what, what's going on. I mean, Pedroia said it a long time ago. He said it's it's a 162 single game season, so like every night is that. So you, you're you're you know, as somebody looking in from the outside, you're like, well, yeah, I'll take. I'll take the ups and downs, you know, like, yeah, they've won what three, three world series, four world series, whatever it's been. Well, when you're a player, you age, it's like dog ears when you get there because of, of just all the ups and downs and every day is that way. So it gets tough, you know, to, to play there sometimes, but at the same time, you know, it, 
when you do have the good times, it, it, it is a it is a great great place to play. Um, you know, so that hopefully when it is that good, it outweighs the bad times. But like I said, as a player, man, it gets it gets tough just to deal with that. You know, that up and down that that roller coaster ride with the what's going on with the coverage. How, how did uh, 2011 obviously was the year of the chicken and beer, and then 2012 you brought in a new manager. Yeah, Vito left. I mean, give me your best Bobby Valentine story because <laughs> when I played there in 2014, dudes were still talking about Bobby Valentine. It was Pedroia, one season. Pedroia was like, I Pedroia was like the best. I mean, he, he they did not see eye to eye at all. So give me your best Bobby Valentine story and in, in, from that year. Man, it, the the well, I say the the craziest one I saw was he pinch hit. Who was it? I want to say it was Jose Iglesias. He, we were in Toronto, and he pinch hit for Jose Iglesias in a like a one-two count. He, I forgot who he pinch hit him for, or who he brought in for Jose. Jose was hitting and wasn't a great. Uh, he was still kind of learning how to hit in the big leagues. He was he was a younger younger guy, and so gosh, I want to. No, I don't know who was there. I forgot who he pinch hit for him, but that that was probably I hadn't seen the the old you know two strike pinch hit before, and uh, he he threw him in on that one, and that was that was a tough one. I don't think it went well, um, but man, it's just it was a weird, crazy year, you know. Obviously, when you come off a guy like Tito to a guy like Bobby Valentine, very different personalities. Um, just you know, we never, I don't really think anybody meshed and and. Um, you know, obviously, we that was kind of an understatement by our record and what we had to deal with that year. But um, you know, we we made it we made up for it the next year, I guess. Yeah, and I know there were plenty of good moves made um, from twelve to thirteen in terms yeah, well, of player transactions. The biggest one was getting rid of Bobby Valentine, right? So <laughs> was was there was there a mutiny of sorts? Were, were there players going to front office members, right, and being like, "Yo, it's as bad as it looks." <laughs> I think, you know, I think they knew. I mean, obviously, anytime you have disgruntled players, it, it, it filters up to the to the front office. And uh, they knew what was going on. It's just it's one of those deals, man. I think you kind of had to ride it out and let it play out. And, and you know, hopefully it would get fixed. And it, it just never did. And, um, you know, they, they obviously parted ways and went a different direction in the offseason. How did it change so fast? the next year where you guys like, holy shit. And I know what, how many, there were like maybe six, seven moves that were made, right. That really helped give the team a boost in addition to the core that you already had. Yeah. I mean, I think that was the biggest thing is the dudes you brought in. Right. So you had guys like Ryan Dempster, um, Johnny Gomes, Mike Napoli, Shane Victorino, just like clubhouse guys. And that really changed our mentality. And I think the biggest thing with those guys is they didn't, you know, cause it, it, it's hard as a free agent to come in there and, and, and kind of be yourself right away. And these guys didn't care about anything and they cared about winning. They cared about us um, being together, being a, a nucleus and, and playing good, hard baseball. And they, they brought this mindset, especially to our position players, um, about, you know, this is back when you can slide into second and about, you know, going in hard, running the bases the right way. Uh, just the little things they talked about really kind of turned the corner, especially for some of our younger guys that, that needed it. Um, and, you know, I think the other part is, um, they, they, like I said, they just brought a different swagger that we hadn't seen in Boston and, and other than David, um, these guys just just came in and took command of our clubhouse and and really made us a better team, even though on paper they didn't show that. You know, that they made us a better team in the clubhouse. I was there in 14, mm -hmm. and people always say, oh, man, you must have hated Boston. Dude, I love playing in Boston. It was, I mean, other than the results, which we were terrible, I mean, yeah. other than John, everyone else on the team was terrible that year. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it was great. I mean, I'm tell I tell people all the time, like they're like, "Oh, you had to hate living in Boston." I was like, "I love living in Boston." I mean, anything you wanted, the city was open to you. We did tarp slides. I did tarp slides with my family. We got rained out. I think it was July Fourth. Mm -hmm. We were doing tarp slides on Fenway Park. 
then I think I got released like two days later. Maybe that was <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they didn't want you doing Maybe that. They didn't want to <laughs> but I, I'm telling you, like anything you wanted in Boston, it was incredible. And the guys were yeah. awesome. I mm-hmm. mean, we had Lester, Lackey, Gomes, all guys I, you know, David Ross, Pedroia, David, who I came up with. They were all unbelievable guys. I mean, I can't, I have nothing but good things to say yeah, about it was Boston, fun the organization. Vibes, right? It was right? great. Mm-hmm. And, and I think sometimes people, don't understand you can have a great clubhouse and still not be a good team or you can yeah. have a bad clubhouse and still win because you're just good and i think what he's saying about that 13 team you throw in the marathon bombing mm-hmm. you throw in david's speech where he's the only guy in the world at that time that could say fuck <laughs> yeah in the, on national tv and nobody cares you know they they almost encouraged, encouraged it. exactly yeah right and then just every and then if you look at their postseason i mean the tory hunter the david ortiz tory hunter play the, the craziness in the World Series. They were just meant to win because yeah. – and that's the way it is, and that good for them. Yeah, I, I mean, to your point, AJ, I think that's – sometimes there's just a year where you're, everything goes right, right? Like you have the walk-offs at the right time. You have, you know, the big hit. The guy makes the the right pitch at the right time to the right guy, and, and things just flow and work for you. Um, I've been a part of that, and I've seen it from the other side as well, from other teams, and – for whatever reason, it just is what it is, and and they're meant to to move on and and you know kind of get their shot. So then, fast forwarding a bit, I've spoken to fans, both Boston fans and, and Cubby fans, that are like bittersweet. Hey, John Lester had such a rich history and career with Boston, and I wish he played that all out. And then other fans, even some Boston fans, are like. Man, I loved Lester, but for Cubs fans to experience finally breaking the long ass curse, like it's one of the best feelings as a sports fan that you could have. So, were you surprised that you didn't spend your whole career there? I'm sure there were times when you were there where you were like, "Oh, I'm riding this out. This is going to be just me with one organization, like Pedroia." And yeah. I mean, I know Big Poppy had a little bit of twins, but barely. Yeah. Yeah, I mean. It, it, yeah, I mean, I was surprised and, and you know, it, it, it's tough when, you know, same thing. AJ can speak to this too. When you're with one team and, and you only see yourself with one team and you, you pour your heart and soul into the city and, and the organization and, uh, you know, you forget that it's a business and the business side of baseball sucks sometimes. And you, you, you get some, t- like for me, I got slaps kind of across the face with it and, and was like, oh yeah, this is a business and they have to run their organization the way they want to run it. And if they don't feel that, you know, I don't want to say you're worth whatever, um, then they have to move on. They have to make a business decision. And, and they did that and, you know, got traded out to Oakland and, and did that for, for two months. And then, you know, now you come into this, this deal, this weird kind of free agent, you know, where am I going to play? What, am, you know, what's life like after this? um kind of moment and then you know kind of your ex-girlfriend comes back to you you know what I mean like you know the Red Sox come back and they're the first ones that we meet with and and you're going through all these emotions again um so I mean it was a tough time but a fun time at the same you know the same it it was the free agent experience was really really cool and and I got to see other teams and how they run the organizations and and all that and you know it just didn't work out but it, it worked out I think in the better for for myself, my family, and and obviously Chicago. You mean you didn't want to come play with the 2015 Braves with me? We were awesome that year. We finished like <laughs> 65 hey, and 97 or something like that. Hey, I uh, I would have. We had just moved to this this house that we're in, and in, in uh, at the end of 14. So I was like, man, it would be really cool that. And Truist was going to be built. I think what was it? 16 was the first year for the 17. For the 17. Yeah, yeah. So I'd have been two years at. Uh, at uh turner and and you know still an easy drive even with the atlanta traffic and um you know now the new fields right around the corner so I, it, it would have worked out it would have been fun i know that but um like i said it, it things happen for a reason and i'm, I'm yeah. glad i knew where i did you, you made the right decision uh yeah you, you totally <laughs> it worked right out decision. it worked out what was the offer though when the red sox i remember 14 i was already gone you get tra- lackey got traded gomes got traded you got traded from that 14 yeah. team Lackey came to St. Louis with me. You went to Oakland with Johnny. First of all, switching teams is the hardest thing to do the first time. 
Because you, you've yeah. never done it. You came up with the Red Sox, and I remember the first time I switched teams, you're like, oh, my gosh, this is a whole new world. It sucks. What was that like? And then we'll get into a little bit more. I want Because I have some questions about some more stuff there. Um, well, I think it's weird going, especially – who we got traded for, you know, we got, we got traded for Cespedes, who was like a folk hero out there. So you're already kind of coming in, you know, on, on pins and needles. And it was such a, I don't want to say it it was such a different experience because the team was so much younger than we were. Um, And, and, you know, I was 30 at the time. So, I mean, that, that says a lot, right? Like just a lot of guys, even, even not even based on age, just based on experience in the big leagues. So, they were a young, young team. Um, I knew a couple of the guys just from the Red Sox organization. Um, you know, Ma, Brandon Moss was out there. Uh, and then I had Johnny with me, which really helped. He had played for him before and kind of gave me the rundown on on what to expect and, um, you know, that sort of thing. So it, it's just, man, like you said, it's a weird feeling when you walk in that clubhouse, especially, you know, it's not like you got traded after spring training and, and you've got six months to build this uh, you know, this rapport relationship with guys like you're walking in. I think we walked in on Friday, Saturday, and then I pitched Monday, I think is what it was, or, or I might've pitched Sunday. I pitched Sunday. Um, so you meet the catchers the day before and it's like, all right, what do you want to do? And I'm like, I, I, who are we playing? You know, like you don't even know who you're playing. It's just, it's a weird, it's a weird deal. Um, and then, you know, most of the time when you get traded to a team, it's because they're making a run. So now we went from last place to, to I think they were first at the time or second, or at least in it, whatever they were. Um, and, and now you, you, your, your whole mindset's changing. Like, okay, now we got a chance to, to win a World Series. So, you know, now it's like, okay, it's go time. Um, it's weird, man. It's, it's, such a, it's such a weird feeling walking in there. You're like, you know, the new kid at school and you get everybody looking at you like, you know, whispering behind your back and all that stuff. But um, it was cool. I, I mean, the, got to play for, for Bo Mel um, out there for a little bit, and he's a great manager. Um, so, you know, I mean, it, it's 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 just weird. It's a weird feeling. So you mentioned the ex-girlfriend part. Can you clarify for some fans during trade deadline season, especially that go, oh, just trade him. He's about to be a free agent. And then you can get some good shit back and then you can re-sign him in the off season, which almost never happens, even if yeah. the team is interested. Like even this year, of course, all the talks about Otani and I don't think he's going to be traded, but people are, there are some delirious angels fans that are like trade him. You can get a ton and then you can sign him in the off season. I'm like, good luck with that. So what yeah. is that ex-girlfriend experience? Like if a team does come crawling back to you once you hit free agency. Well, it's tough. It, it, it's good. It, I think it's a it's a it's a good thing and a bad thing, right? Like, so you sit down with them. You already know the whole spiel they're going to give you because you've been there for how long, right? So, you know, kind of what their selling points are going to be. So you got the familiarity with it, and and you don't have to worry about the jitters and meeting somebody new and all that. The hard part is, is when you have these other teams that are interested in you. You know, they're selling you. They're selling you on something that they're they're wanting you to come be a part of. Right. So now you kind of see, and then also too, like, I didn't know I could play anywhere else other than Boston, you know, like I've only worn that Jersey. So you send me somewhere and now I figure out, Oh, well, baseball's just baseball. Right. Then, then you kind of go, okay, well maybe I could play in Chicago or maybe I could play in San Francisco. Um, you know, so you start thinking about these things and then now they're trying to woo you over here. And so it just be, kind of comes a competition and, and then it becomes like, OK, well, I already know what's over here. Right. Like, so what do you guys got? Like, OK, Cubs, you've got Chris Bryant coming. You got Javi Baez coming. You got Kyle Schwarber coming. You got all these guys that are supposed to be studs coming. Then you just traded for Dexter Fowler and you got Miguel Montero and you just OK, wait, now you just signed Joe Madden. Okay, well, you know, well, this is looking pretty cool over here, you know, so it's like, that's the hard part, right? Like, you don't see the free agent, or not the free agent, the the guy that gets traded turn free agent, come back that often, because everybody else is trying to sell what they've got, I think a little bit harder than than the team you're with. Well, having Theo there, right, had to help. Well, yeah, there you go. Yeah, I forgot about that. That, I mean, that was a big thing, right? Like, I've known Theo since... I was in the minor leagues, you know, so 
uh, it, it just like you had that familiar side of it and which kind of helped ease into the new side. You know what I'm saying? Like, so it helped me like, okay, maybe I can play over here and be a part of this and he'll help me kind of fit in and, and make sure that everything will be good. And, you know, you kind of get that, that family feeling and then, but you're still part of a new team. So, um, but yeah, man, it's, I, I think it's just when you do that too, you've got that feeling of, you know, well, they, they got rid of me. They didn't want me, you know, th these, these other teams, they want me, they want me just a little bit more than you do. So then you start looking at that a little bit harder as opposed to the, the old team. That's well, when we talked to Johnny Damon, when he went from Boston to New York, he said the same thing. He's like, New York, Boston, I knew what I had in Boston, but New York came after me and said, well, maybe if Boston really wanted me, they would have signed me. Now, New yep. York, they really want me because they're offering me a better deal to for a new place, which totally makes sense. But you're a liar because in 2014, <laughs> we played together. You, Gomes, Lackey, Ross, you guys had conversations and, and maybe I, I remember these. We're going to go to Boston. We're, we're going to go to Chicago after we're all free agents. <laughs> and we're going to win. Now, see, he knows I'm right. Because yeah, I was no, like, man, did. maybe take me with you guys too. I'd be kind of cool. Right. You guys had those conversations before you became a free agent and went to Chicago. Well, well, yeah. I mean, I think you, you always, you always, you know, is the grass greener, right? Like, Hey, we all have this opportunity at the end of, of this year. And this is, this is pre getting traded too. Like, were you still like in the back of my mind, I'm still thinking I'm going to sign here, you know, like I'm still, I'm still going to be here and it, 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 you know, we can talk about this stuff, but doesn't mean that it might actually happen. Um, you know, and also too, there's got to be, they they there's got to be interest on the other side. Like you don't know, maybe I'm not in the Cubs' plans. Maybe they're dude, not. You ready. knew Theo, dude. You knew Theo was coming after you. Don't even. <laughs> you knew Theo was coming. Are you kidding me? I, I, yeah, I just didn't know. I didn't know that they were doing full court press, um, like they did. I had an idea, but you know, they they like Theo even told me after we got all the the stuff done. He's like, you know, this this kind of sped up the process a little bit. We were we were gonna go you know, full court and 16 going into 16, um, as opposed to going into 15. And then, you know, obviously, like I said, they got, I think they had some deals that fell in that made them go, okay, we, we might need to spend a little bit of money this year. And then obviously getting Joe, I think was like, Ooh, we, 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 we really need to spend some money. We, we can, we can maybe do this a year quicker than we were planning. Um, and, you know, and I think he wasn't ready to bring up the prospects like he, he ended up doing. Um, so, yeah, I mean, like I said, man, I think we all had conversations about other teams, you know, because you like when we got traded to uh, to Oakland, I asked uh, I asked guys about other teams as well, where they've been, where they've played. And, you know, you start kind of putting that in the filing cabinet of when, you know, who's going to who's going to come after you. And if they do, you know, I asked about the Yankees. I asked about all, you know, different teams just to see you know, what's out there, what they thought. And that way you can kind of go in and with maybe a little head start on the whole process. But, yeah, you man. You, the you, you were never going to the Yankees. You never <laughs> pitched for the Yankees. No, I never you got a call. You for the Red Sox in Oakland, like the two teams that hate the Yankees the most. You're not going to all of a sudden say, oh, man, I'm going to go to the Yankees. Damon no. did. <laughs> yeah, but Damon's different than John. John has a little – Damon's a little more crazy than John. <laughs> I mean, Johnny is a little, lot more crazy than hey, John I would, Lester. I know I would have listened to him if they called. I know that. Yeah, well, we all would have, but hey, you know. if the Yankees, I mean, come on, let's let's do simple math here. It's it's cool to get pitched and have your friends and all of that. If the Yankees offered thirty million dollars more on an overall deal, wouldn't you be very seriously considering going there during that free agent period? One hundred percent. And you know that was the that was the hard part because like when we got down to the nitty gritty at the end, the Giants came in and were were going to give me the seventh year guaranteed, but I had to make a decision, you know, then. Um, which we were down to right when we were going to make the decision anyway. But when you get a seventh year guaranteed for another, I think it was another 25, you know, you're like, ooh, like I, I need to I need to think about this. Um but you know coming coming back from Oakland and getting to play out there and seeing kind of how West Coast baseball is, it was just something that we didn't want to do. I, I wanted to stay more, uh, you know, a little more local than that. But yeah, I mean, to, to your point, yeah, you got to sit down and and really contemplate, 
you know, do I want to take this extra year or do I want to go somewhere, you know, kind of like Chicago or wherever, Yankees or wherever it is, and, and you know, be a part of that? One, one, he, 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 listen, he what? made the right decision. Obviously. He was never. We're not, we're listen, not doing a therapy session. I know, right? I know, but I'm just saying, <laughs> here's the thing. Like, I heard those dudes talk about this, okay? They had this plan. They knew what they were doing because Who? Theo, Lester, Lackey, Ross, Gomes, he didn't get thrown well, in. Gomes, didn't, Gomes make didn't make the cut, though. Right? We tried. We tried to get him uh, I think Napoli was maybe in that conversation. Did, Did you try to get Gomes there? Were you guys like, hey, sign Johnny? Yeah, I mean, every you know, when he's a free agent, you always want to kind of bring, you know, like Johnny, I was within Oakland. He's like, you know, try to get me over there if you can. And, and um you know, we tried, you know, like especially the clubhouse dudes like that, that, you know, on a younger team, I think would really help. Um, you know, Lack pitched another year in, in St. Louis and then and then we got him over there. Um, and then we obviously, you know, Rossi was there for the two years. But yeah, man, I mean, I think you, you, you know, we, we tried to get shields, um, you know, like you, you, you end up, you know, you end up meeting guys along the way and, and, and you're like, man, this guy I think would fit in over here. And then when they're free agents, you try to, you try to help out the cause a little bit and try to, you know, talk Theo and those guys into spending a little bit of money. And, um, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Hey, Johnny ended up okay. Cause he went to the Royals in 2015 and he won another ring. True. So yes. Yeah. He went from the, he went from the mighty Braves in 2015 to the Royals. Yeah. He went from the shit house to the penthouse. Real quick. The speech. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He gave the speech at the white house, the whole, have you ever, and I know you and Lackey are, are super tight. Yeah. Have, didn't you get your first career hit off Lackey? I did. Literally I, off of him. It was yes, off, ha, off of him. Yes. You hit him, right? With a yes. line drive. Yeah. Have you ever uh, let him live that uh, down? Because he's a super competitive dude. I'd be like, I'd be texting him like once a day. Be like, I, you know, I got my first hit off. Just him. send Still, a clip. <laughs> just, yeah. Just every one, like once, like, just oh. every few days. Be like, hey, by the way, don't ever forget this. Oh shit. Did that well, reset here, my back? Here's, <laughs> here's the problem with that though, is, is he won the game. So mm. he'll like, if I did that, he would just text right back. Well, at least I won the game. You know, I still won the game or whatever. So the best part about that story is, is, you know, prior to that, like we were talking crap to each other and we had an understanding if the game wasn't on the line, it was all heaters. Right. So there's no, there's no breaking ball. There's no nothing. So I'm sitting there like, well, I just got to get it going. And it ends up going off of him, get a hit. And I'm standing on first base and I will not look up because he is motherfucking me from the mound as the train <laughs> on the field to, to check on him. Right. So I'm trying not to laugh at him because I know if I laugh at him, he might throw the ball at me like in, and, and maybe my next at bat or, or just at first base and, and kill me. But he is, I mean, just screaming at me from, from the mound and screaming at the trainer to get off the field. And then, like I said, he won the game and then came over to my house and drank all my beer. So uh, <laughs> I think, I think he ended up in the overall one. Um, you know, I mean, the hitting part is fun, but I think I got the ball somewhere around here in the house. I don't even, I don't even think it's out displayed anywhere. That's funny. So my favorite John Lackey, John Lester story in 14 with the Red Sox, I'm catching him in spring training and Tori Lovello is the bench coach and he gives you the signs like throw overs and pitch out. Now, nobody at the time knew about John's problem throwing the first and nobody also knew that Lackey never threw over. So I'm out there and I give the throw over sign, whatever it was, thumb or whatever the heck it was. And, they, and Lester goes, and I'm like, <laughs> did you do that i'm like go over and he's like and i'm like oh, okay fuck it fastball in All right whatever yeah. then the next day lackey's pitching they throw over and john's like lackey's like mm -mm. and i'm like hey they're calling it he's like mm -mm. so after the inning i'm like dude the second day second time we're like what the hell's going on and they're like just so you know we don't throw over so if they call it just act like you don't see it <laughs> Both of them. i'm like wait what and they're like just act like you didn't see it just we don't throw yeah. over and it, this was before the whole thing came up with John. Yeah. And I was like, wait, what do you mean? He's like, I can't throw to first, but don't tell anybody. <laughs> and I was like, okay. Like, I, I'm not telling anybody. But it was just the weirdest thing is they're both like, mm -mm, just act like you don't see it. If they give the sign, just be like, oh, look, there's a plane yeah. overhead. <laughs> <laughs> well, so we had a the, the backstory to that is we had a, a deal, uh, was it the year before? Because Tori was there in 13. And they would call throwovers all the time. And – 
Lack finally just got fed up. He's like, can you guys just let me pitch? And so that that's kind of where it came up, where it was like it was, you know, every three pitches he was he was thrown over to first base because they were like, oh, we got their signs. We know they're running or something. Um, and so, like, that's kind of how it started. And then Lack, you know, Lack in spring training, it's probably more of like, you know, hey, man, just let me pitch type thing. Quit calling all these throwovers. Um but yeah, I mean that that's kind of where it all started. It was in, in thirteen they they called it so much that guys just got kind of tired of tired of doing it. Now, when you fast forward, what were the conversations like when teams were trying to make it a whole thing and and probably to an extent, just like we talked earlier with the chicken and beer, the media has something new to talk about and they're all over it. Yeah, I mean, like I told people all the time, man, like if if I knew if I knew what was going on or, or how to fix it, do you, I mean, don't you think I would have fixed it? Right. Like you, you think I like looking over, especially being left-handed. You think I like looking over there and seeing the guy 20 feet off the bag? Like you, you, it, that, that's not fun <laughs> for me either, you know? So, um, you know, I think the best part about it, man, Joe and Davey Martinez handled it. And so did Chris Bazio, you know, we talk about it. We talk about ways to combat it. We talk about different things I could do. It's not like I didn't work on it. Um, you know, people think that I just, oh, you don't work on it. That's why you don't do it. I mean, spring training, you can ask Chris Bazio how many times in the backfield that, you know, stretches at nine o'clock at seven forty five, eight o'clock, we were down out there working before anybody was there. So it's not a matter of work or anything like that. Like I said, if I knew how to fix it, trust me, I would have done it a long time ago and not even worried about it. But um, we just tried to come up with ways to combat it. And, you know, kind of the funny part about the whole thing is it ended up screwing a few teams because they were so worried about it and what they wanted to do. Um, you know, Rossi picked a couple guys off, back picked them, you know, threw some guys out. I know 15, the stolen bases got a little out of hand. But after that, I think if you look at the numbers, they were pretty comparable to a lot of people in the league. Um you know, having a guy that can catch and throw like Rossi and, and then going from him to Wilson Contreras, who's got a stupid arm and, and very athletic back there and back picking and not scared to throw the ball anywhere on the field, you know, really helped me. Um, you know, I, like I said, you know, we, if you look at like what the Dodgers tried to do against the against me in the NLCS in both those games, they ended up kind of getting out of their own game and in their own head on the whole thing. Uh, and then, you know, I had a couple teams come in that, the first time through the lineup, they were told they had to try to bunt at least twice. So, you know, you know what I'm saying? Like I got, I think it was the Diamondbacks. I got Paul Goldschmidt trying to lay down a bunt. Like, please. <laughs> thank you. Know? you. Yeah, like, thank you. Yeah. Go for it, dude. Like now you're all one as opposed to if you were up there, maybe you hit a homer on the swing instead of trying to bunt. So like I said, man, we, I just tried to turn a negative into a positive and, and it just, just, forget about it really. And then we got a couple picks and, you know, guys started shortening their leads and, and it became, you know, now with the pitch clock, I don't think I could have done some of the things that, that, that uh, I did with as far as holding the ball and stepping off and, and varying in my looks, you know, slide step, leg kick, that sort of thing. And uh, I just tried to get better at things that I could control um, as opposed to something that I couldn't control and don't know why or where it came from. And, it is what it was. And, and then kind of just tried to make, like I said, you know, make that, make a positive out of something that hindered me at one time. Dude, you were quick to the plate. So it wasn't like you were high leg kick. I mean, you were pretty quick. So it wasn't, yeah. it wasn't like you get a hugely and you were slow to the plate. Trust me. I, I remember getting on first and he was pitch he was pitching and, and it was like 2015 in the, after he hit me, my first at bat, by the way, I'm still pissed about him. <laughs> um, but the elbow guard, wasn't it? Dude, you still hit me. It doesn't matter. It still hurts. But I get on first and the first base coach is like, Hey, you know, he can't throw over. So get a big lead. Well, you get uncomfortable because I can't run. And they're like, yo, get a huge lead. And I'm like, I'm going to get my ass back picked. Like, yeah. no. Yeah. So you get out there as a runner and you're like, I am so far off the base. Oh my God. It's like worse. It was worse than just having your normal lead. And being like, all right, I just know he's not going to throw over. Just take my normal secondary. Instead, you're like 40 feet out there, and you're like, dude, I'm dead. Like, what do yeah. I do here? It, it was it was worse. It made it – like you said, it made it worse for a lot of people. Yeah, and that, I mean, that's the thing. Like I said, it, it kind of 
they kind of got in some other guys' heads as well. And and I heard I've heard that from from other guys. Like you get out there and and it's like no man's land, and your first move is almost back when when I lift my leg, even though you know I'm not coming over there. So instead of getting a, a secondary and, and and getting ready for the ball to be put in play, their first move is kind of leaning back. So now if the ball does get put in play, they're not getting the same jump that they did uh, if they had their secondary or anything like that. So like I said, it just, it, 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 we, we, we just tried to combat it and, and come up with ways to, to, you know, we did the, the, the bounce pass if I had to feel the ground ball or whatever. And, um, you know, like I said, I don't think, I don't think it really, other than 15, the stolen bases, you know, that probably cost me a few runs throughout that year. But, uh, after that, I think, you know, we, we did a good job of, of controlling somewhat of the running game. So let's finish with this. Obviously, aside from whatever we spoke about, any stories that stand out to you that you can finish with, like that you say couldn't share during your playing days, but now it's funny to fuck around with? Oh, there's, so, I mean, you put me on the spot. I, I should have been thinking about this before. Uh, before. <laughs> Let's keep it clean. We don't want anyone in trouble now. Yeah. No, no. Uh, I mean, I, I don't know if like any off the top of my head that that kind of stand out. I mean, I think there's one kind of legendary one, and I don't know if he if you guys have had Ryan Dempster on or if if you've talked to him about this. But the, it was one night in New York, and we we're playing the Yankees the next day, and he. Uh, you know, uh, PV always used to play his guitar and we're hanging out in his room and, uh, you know, everybody disperses and goes to bed and, and, you know, the next day we show up the field and it's him and Gomes and they're like, Hey, you're not going to believe what, what Demp did last night. I'm like what? He's like, he took Peeves guitar and they walked to times square and he set up in times square. Now th this is kind of the creepy part. I don't know. It's like one, two o'clock in the morning. I don't know what time it was. And, Gomes is is filming it, and there's nobody in Times Square. I mean, not a soul other than these two guys. And Demp just sits down on this bench and starts playing God knows what. I don't even know if he knows how to play the guitar. <laughs> and uh, he said this uh, this lady walks by, this older lady that they said had gotten off of, like, her cleaning job or something at, you know, 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. And they they didn't start talking to her until afterwards, but she, like, walks by, and she, like, kind of looks at these guys and, they're still in their suits from us traveling and she throws a dollar in the guitar case and starts walking off. Um, so, I mean, it, like stuff like that. I mean, playing with those guys, you hear these stories all the time, but I, I thought that one was pretty, pretty <laughs> crazy. Just him going to times square by himself, playing the guitar and this lady coming off of her job that she has to get off work at three in the morning, puts a dollar in his, in his guitar case. They were that entertaining. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, <laughs> they have Dempster come in the next year because he retired after 2013. Yeah, and they made him come to New York, and he like gave us a, a pep talk in in the Yankee Stadium clubhouse. Didn't work, but it was funny as hell. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it didn't work, a, but it was funny he's as a hell. Damn comedian. Yeah. Oh so. yeah, that's good shit. Hey, John, really great to catch up with you, man. Obviously, we appreciate the time, and it, it was fun reminiscing here. Yeah, man. Thanks. Uh, you guys are doing a great job, man. I like your guys's your skit that you're doing. <laughs> thank you really appreciate it hey, sean go hit the links now all right because yeah yeah buddy. you're too you're too good now so now maybe you shouldn't hit the links. I, that's why actually we're doing this because i'm making aj worse at golf hey, we, we played together day. in dallas we did we and did he kicked my ass I'm and he's sure like you dude you, everyone no he's like you suck and i'm like dude i can't get to play anymore <laughs> well i did i did get pretty lucky that round aj i mean dude you I, had I, two he had two of the greatest shots i've ever seen in my life really just he had, he hit a shot that was that it would make any professional golfer proud on what was that 14 14 15 yeah 14 like from a guy's backyard drilled it into the hole like and I'm not talking like hits the flag like perfectly ooh, rolls like just yeah. drops in mm -hmm. then we go in 17 on this part three hits it over the grandstand so he gets a free drop and he has to hit it through like the walkway which is probably this wide and there's a ramp there where for like the cables you know one trips on them hits the ramp. Stops it, shoots it up in the air, boop, 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 about eight feet past, makes the putt, greatest part I've ever seen. Wow. <laughs> greatest part I've ever seen. I'm like, that's the greatest yeah. part I've ever seen. Yeah. yeah.
And then, and then on 18, I hit it in the grandstands again because I wasn't going to go in the water and got a free drop from that and ended up chipping it up and making a two-putt par. So that was – yeah. I, if there's no grandstands, those balls, they're 50 yards over or whatever, and there's no chance of even doing anything. So That's the key, kids. Yeah. Hit it over the grandstand. Yeah, just, just play what you're dealt with. That was, it was yeah. an unbelievable round. That's why those PGA guys aren't that good because they just hit it off. They use the grandstands and get free drops. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Boom, roasted. Hey, good yeah. stuff, John. Good catching up, dude. All right, guys. Thanks. <laughs> Cheers. And Thanks, props John. to the uh, yeah, MLB man. Players Alumni Association for making this all happen behind the scenes. And you can head to baseballalumni.com for much more info on your favorite former players. And you can catch new episodes of Legends Territory every week on Foul Territory's YouTube channel and wherever you get your pods. See you next time.